Okay. Okay. And Ron will look at me. Aloha. Welcome to the Art of Thinking Smart. Uh, my name is Roger Epstein. I am the third substitute uh, interviewer today, replacing uh, uh, Michael North, who was replacing David Chang. And it's my great pleasure to be here today with Ron Porter uh, uh, and talking about his story and his unique journey of uh, not only thinking smart, uh, but learning a whole new way to think, going from uh, a Hawaiian surfer and uh, uh, skin diver uh, to international uh, economists and international relations and how he put people together with the economy. Ron, uh, Ron is now with OHA as an economist and part of their uh, strategic investment group. Mm -hmm. So nice to have you with us today, Ron. Good to be here. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Ron, uh, I think the audience would love to hear how you started and where your journey took you and how that helped you really expand your thinking and, and not only just thinking smart, but learning how to think smart and, and how that worked for you. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I believe that career paths are just extensions of who you really are, right? So if you can look back at and what you what you thought was important growing up, I think that's a good indicator of where you're headed in the future, mm -hmm. right? And um, as far as as my thinking goes, um, or what I thought when I was young, things like uh, value creation, how it's exchanged, the inequalities of that, and injustices of that were very important to me growing up. Um, I remember having debates or talks with my father. We talk about this kind of thing. So as a, young, as a young boy, you were really thinking about yeah. the world, how people relate, and why there's so much inequality, and, yeah. Yeah. and, and the and people aspect was important to you. Right, right. And, um, and as you go forward in your career, I think those stick with you. Right? Mm -hmm. So uh, when I got to university, uh, I went to the University of Hawaii, Manoa, uh, studied peace studies at uh, under the Sparks Masanaga Peace Institute under Brian Hallett. Yeah. And um, he was very instrumental in in guiding me towards um, understanding things that I have been thinking about for, for a long time. And um, while in that program, um, we did a lot of conflict resolution kind of stuff, but we also did international relations kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's, that's what you see in the news, you know, nations reacting and, and interacting with other nations. And, and so you got started at that yeah. level right. with the, 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 the micro, if right. you will, people. Right. And then in the bigger world and the bigger how this relates to the bigger context, right, right, doing and both I, at the same time. And you know, you, you, you look at the news and, and you watch the news and you think, well, that's important, right? So, you, so I per, and you personally latched on to if I want to see what is causing injustice in the world, I'm going to attach myself to that because that seems like it's important, mm -hmm. right? So I went that route, um, uh, followed that for a while through my, my bachelor's and um, Quickly went into my master's degree. That was in Japan. You graduated in 2004, right? 2004, from UH with yeah. a bachelor's degree, and yeah. then you decided, yeah. what do I do next? Right. You you further your your, you know, you try to find answers to to the questions you still have, right? So you take the next step and you go to your master's. Were you thinking degree. about career at that time? Um, I I had an idealistic kind of. Uh, view at the time I wanted to work in an international organization. I thought uh, working for the United Nations was something that I would like to do. Mm -hmm. um, I was a, a firm you know, advocate of international organizations. Where there's a lot of people that are not, but I was at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, and Japan was is heavily involved in the creation of international organizations, whether it's the United Nations or OECD. So they had some good graduate programs. So Japan being a place where they don't even have a military and having struggled so much and right. suffered so much during World War II, they've been right. focused amongst... Right. Self-defense force, but no, no military. Right, but, um, but they're leaders in this, yeah. and so you thought, okay, maybe Japan would be a so, good place. So I, I looked at specific uh, programs in Japan and, and was able to go there for my master's. And 
uh, while I was during my master's time, I explored international relations, the theories of international relations. You were getting a master's in international, yeah. and you had a scholarship there in Japan. Right, right, right. So that was another good reason to go yeah, there. Yeah, that, that helped. That helped, yeah. So, but, um, so going through that next stage of inquiry um, led me to to focusing in a little bit more on the economic side of of, uh, of international processes and, and relations between people and relations between bigger units like like companies or multinational companies or nations. And, and how that has an impact at the bottom. Right, and how that affects the individual people. Can you think right. back to how your thinking was starting to change? As a kid, you're idealistic, you yeah. want to save the world, you want to do... You go to school, you get a, a degree in peace studies, right. and well, now you're beginning to, to hone in a little more. And well, right. this economic aspect is pretty important all the way around. Right. My, my path towards economics, well, I, I am an economist today, and my path towards economics was not a straight line <laughs> by any means. It yeah. was, I, I avoided um, economics uh, like the plague, I would say. And, and tried to focus in on other things that I hoped were more important than mm -hmm. economics. And, mm -hmm. and it, it had to do with the, the whole idea of, of the very, very narrow scope of our economic system today. But growing up, I, I didn't know that, that, that it was such a narrow scope, mm -hmm. that it doesn't have to be this way. So therefore, I avoided it as much as possible. But as I, as I was going into my, into my studies a little more, um, I started seeing that economics is not only what people tell us it is. Mm. Right? It's not only the exchange of money. Mm. It is really, it's really the, the production uh, modes of people. Mm -hmm. and how The production of goods and services. Goods and services, which goes back to pretty much an expression of the individual. Mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. when you look at it that way, it's a very nice thing. Economics is a very nice thing. It's, yeah. it's the expression of individual um, consciousness. It's it, it, what, is, what is valuable to the individual expressed externally, and how do we trade that? How do we exchange that? And their creativeness. And, and let people, other people enjoy the, the value that somebody else mm -hmm. created, right? That's mm -hmm. economics. To right? be of service. Right. And uh, we're not taught that in school. We're, we're taught that economics is the distribution of limited resources, and mm -hmm. that is a turnoff, right? Mm -hmm. when, you, when you hear that, mm -hmm. that's, that's mm -hmm. competitive, and, and, and there's a lot of friction in that interpretation. Yeah. So as, as I started to go forward, I, I started exploring economics in a more broad, broad way with a more um, diverse understanding of what it is, the fundamentals of what it is and what it can do. Mm -hmm. And by the time I got to my PhD studies, um, I was still hesitant. So even if you, if you see my, um, my doctoral dissertation, it's pretty much all about economics, but the word economics is not in the title. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, that was a, a, a conscious decision on my part. So even at the end of my doctoral studies, I was still hesitant to buy into the notion that this is actually really, really important. And um, it wasn't until after that, and when I was uh, a faculty member in, in Asia, um, following my doc doctoral studies. Well, let's, uh, let's go back on your history a little bit. So you're in Japan. Yeah. You speak Japanese? I speak conversational Japanese. But you didn't when you went there? No, not before. And so you spent a couple of years in Japan getting a master's degree in international relations. And you finished that, and then you said... Went straight into a PhD. Straight program. into a PhD the at, same, the same, at the same... School, and the and same what's the university, university you were at? Ritsumeikan Asia Pacific University. Ritsumeikan Asia Pacific University. Yeah. So you were able to get a, a master's and stay there and get a PhD. Yeah. And then Fast -track date right what right was there. the title of your PhD? Uh, Cyclical Continuity in uh, Mongolian Political History. I think that was, that was the, the... So here's a kid from yeah. Hawaii yeah. who is uh, really into local culture but has a big heart of how can I help the world. Mm -hmm. Go to college and find yourself in Japan. Now all of a sudden you're doing a PhD on Mongolia. Right. right. And, 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 and why Mongolia? Uh, I had connections uh, to Mongolia 
some family connections. Some family that, connections that, that um, allowed me to have a home base when I when I was doing re, uh, field research. So yeah. I thought, you know, not many people are doing research on that region, and it's a very um, important historical region, mm -hmm. right? So the the continental northeast Asian region where China, Mongolia, and Russia, and the the political economy of that region, and and how it 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 affects not only China and Russia, but also Mongolia in the middle as a as, as sandwich between these two these two big. So powers. you get an unusual look from Mongolia, a huge country which which uh, at one time controlled all of China, right? And right. now is kind of a backwards right. area, looking for their own economy and how it fits in the politics, right. and and between two monsters, right. of course, which China believes it owns Mongolia. And, right, and, and it has the, if you, if you look at Mongolia-China relations today, mm -hmm. it, it's, a, it's a pretty clear-cut case for how, how China is dealing with Xinjiang, Tibet, and, and parts of Vietnam yeah. um, economically. Why, why they think that they have a certain sphere of influence over these areas, and that there's a historical story there. And um, it may not be the historical story that they themselves are articulating, but there are truths on both sides. And then um, looking at the economic relations between China and Mongolia really um, puts in a framework into, into how Beijing today is dealing with these inner Asian areas. So we're going to take a break in a second, but I just want to recap to where we are mm -hmm. that all this training now is getting you to understand an unusual situation, but it highlights the personal relations that the economics has to do on not only the country but on all the people. Mm -hmm. And then we'll talk about how you bring that back to Hawaii right after the break. Okay. Thanks, Ron. Aloha, my name is Justine Spiritu. This I is my co host Matthew Johnson. No, you're doing great. Every you're Thursday great. at four PM um, on Think Tech. So let's go the from Hawaii there. Food so you want to series. Let's we talk like to a bring little in bit folks more from uh, the whole realm of the local food supply and agriculture. To this anyone working of on these okay. issues, we'll kind of, we'll, any we'll organization or individual that has we'll plans or projects. Yeah. What kind of people have we had? Okay, thanks. Uh, so we've had farmers, we've had and how that chefs, we've had people from government, and government and all this stuff uh, larger institutions, everyone who's working to help make Hawaii's local food system that much better. So you can see us every Thursday and join the conversation on Twitter, and we hope to see you there. Well, aloha. Thank you. Welcome back to uh, Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Roger Epstein. This is the Art of Thinking Smart. Our guest today is uh, Ron Porter, who's now an economist and a, a, a strategic planning uh, officer with uh, OHA. And uh, Ron, you were just talking about your PhD in Mongolia, how it was uh, helping you to understand the bigger picture. Here's, here's a country that's dealing with two big uh, behemoths mm -hmm. and also how, how they're looking at their people and you're learning a lot about how they interact. Right. So in, in Mongolia, my, my focus was how do, how do Mongolians navigate this mm -hmm. right? and how and politically, how do they navigate this? Mm -hmm. And um, that has a lot to do with, with leadership, right? So how, how are leaders born in Mongolia mm. using resources of the region, Yeah, right? Because uh, Mongolia has a specific sub, uh, subsistence economy that doesn't produce much more than, than its own, um, for its own needs, right? right? And that's the uh, traditional animal husbandry, semi-nomadic mm -hmm. animal husbandry mm. economy. Um, so given the specific um, dynamics of the, the economic system in Mongolia, um, it was paramount for, for these leaders or these, these aspiring leaders in Mongolia who wanted to change society to somehow facilitate resources from outside in, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so that, that turned out to be one of the, the catalyzing um, principles for, for acquiring leadership a leadership role and and sustaining that leadership role in mm -hmm. society, and and when you get down to that to that level, you realize okay, um, it doesn't matter how you produce something, but you need to produce something, mm -hmm. right? And that this is this is the base of economics, right? Mm -hmm. People need to produce something that can be exchanged for value, mm -hmm. right? So it was um, 
it was at that time where, where I started seeing that economics does really, really, really matter at the grassroots level. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And uh, we get, we get um, caught up in the, in the grand scheme of things, stock markets and, and this, the, all the fluff that goes right. along with a modern right. economy. And, and we, we tend to forget what it really is. We, we tend to forget what really is commerce. Mm -hmm. right? and, and how it impacts the individual right. and, in every place, not just we, Mongolia, exactly. but every place. Ex every place has it. And, and going to a place like Mongolia, I got to see firsthand an, ec an economic system that is at the base level right mm -hmm. now. There is not mm -hmm. a lot of fluff. Mm -hmm. So we can see the pillars of what they are. Yeah, right. and then and then the leaders are saying we got to bring in new resources right. if we want to go from a subsistence economy mm -hmm. to something more, or even influence. Right, you don't have to tell somebody in a semi-nomadic um, society to go take care of your animals. Right, they're going to do it by themselves because that that's going to sustain them. You know, right. There's no there's no political leverage there. There's yeah, no yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you we, don't need it. You right. just do whatever you have right. to but if you get your next meal. If you facilitate resources from outside that they ca don't have access to that would enhance their lives, then now you, now you have leverage to be a leader. Right. right? Because right. You, and then you sustain that, that, um, that d distribution throughout society. And try to make the society raise the whole level. Right. All, all boats rise with the, with the rising tide. Right. And, and, that, and it hasn't always been done that way. It's been done in very corrupted ways as well. Sure. Right? So, but, but that's the base of, of so, economics. So, so, okay, so you finish your PhD, and now, now where are you? Now you're a grow-up, <laughs> and you've got to actually do some work. <laughs> i got to go work, right? So <laughs> I, I had a faculty stint in Mongolia at the um, university ah. that, that hosted me. So I ended up starting a master's program, a dual-language master's program in public administration helped them to start that. It was funded by um, a Japanese foundation. Oh. Um, you really and bringing these nations years. together, huh? Yeah. China and Japan. Yeah, yeah. And so I taught there for a few years, and there was a sense of clarity when I taught mm -hmm. um, for the next few years uh, that anything that came up, I was able to then uh, incorporate whatever social um, you know, variable that we wanted to put into the framework we could. Right. Um, but that soon started becoming a little stale as well. Mm. So, and I think most most academics go through these phase, phases, you know, where they they are all excited about this new framework that they came up with, and then it starts to not tell the story so much after a while, and they have to retool. Right. And, right. Um, my retooling um, process was throwing everything out of the out of the window and saying, okay, let's start from scratch and let's just go as deep as we can to find what are the pillars holding up society? What are the pillars holding up individuals? And then what are those pillars that then are, are added on to, to build up institutions within, within mm -hmm. society? Mm -hmm. So I ventured further and further and further into that. And like anybody who, who, who does that, um, I, I hit a wall. I, I, I hit the wall of, okay, we as human beings, we know from experience, we have con a, a conscious um, awareness. And uh, what is behind that veil, we don't know. What are we doing right. here? What are we doing? You and I are having a conversation right now. Right. We're pretending we know what the hell we're doing. Right. But we have no idea where we came from, so, what we're doing here, or where we're going. Exactly. So we hit that wall, and then we say, there's no going past that wall. And, you know, for thousands of years, people have been debating what's behind that wall mm -hmm. but, or that veil. Okay. And, and I, that, that's not really interested interesting for me to debate what's behind that, that right. you know, what in, was right. interesting to me then is saying okay we hit that vi we hit that wall mm -hmm. now I'm gonna turn around mm -hmm. and I'm gonna and I'm gonna work now forward forward, forward. whatever the purpose so, is whatever the meaning is let's go do it right so so what the only thing that experience tells us is that you say what are we doing here and pretty much the answer is we are expressing ourselves Expressing ourselves, and that's that gets it. into creating value, and that gets into, and that gets into economy exactly. and commerce, and exactly. and, so, and the out the output and the ability yeah. to create goods and services that help yeah. other people, exactly. and, and make money for you as well. Exactly. So when you break down what it is that it, um, economics is, it gets down to individual expression. Yeah. And that is a nice story. Yeah. And that's a story that I would don't mind calling myself an economist now, right. having, having right. that story of right. what the economics right. is. It, uh, so. it, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a corporate tax lawyer for 45 years, mm -hmm. and people are like, oh, you represent all these big companies. I'm a cog in the machine of creating things. Mm -hmm. 
and we all are in different ways. Right. And, and uh, you could change the system, uh, but you also have to understand it, and, and you can choose to work outside it or work with it. So, mm -hmm. so you then decided it was time to come home. And you've been home about a year now? <clears throat> about a year and a half. About a year and a half. Yeah. No. So. And, and now um, it's exciting because now knowing that economics is actually the, um, the expression of individuals mm -hmm. and, and understanding that the expression of individuals is pretty much infinite. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really fun to, to come to work and, and explore how do we build an infrastructure that can take into account all of these people's inherent value, all of these people's expressions, and, and be able to compensate them for that, and then be able to, to facilitate the exchange. Mm -hmm. And Hawaii has some similarity, not, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in the sense that uh, we don't have a big enough uh, uh, group to, to really uh, create uh, 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 big manufacturing, Right. But what do we do with it? Like the Mongolians, we're past subsistence, obviously. Right. But how do we expand so we take care of everybody right. and eliminate some of the economic injustices? Right, right, and that and that has to do with the structure of our economy today, right? So we we're we're very vertically structured, and then we tend to to focus. What do you mean our, by vertically structured? Well, when when you create an institution, mm -hmm. it it is either. Uh, it, it, it's an institution with its own supply chain, mm. right, and its own outputs. Mm -hmm. And then our economic system tends to only focus on that top layer of these organizations where value is created, economic value is created, mm -hmm. right? So our, our entire economic system is based off of keying in on only that top end of, I see. of these vertical the final, structures. The final the output. The final out output, exactly. Okay. Um, when we view... When we view value as expressions of people, we mm -hmm. see that all along this value chain, up and down and across, mm -hmm. vertically and horizontally, value is being pr pr produced and created all the time. Mm -hmm. we're, we're just not recognizing it. Mm -hmm. right? And the, one of the reasons why our economic system is so exclusive, mm -hmm. that peop not everybody has access to, to playing that game, is because it's a very narrow circle. It's a very narrow train track that focuses in on only recognizing the top end value of these vertical institutions. Can you give me an example of where you would put in a horizontal model in the tourist business or in? Well, a, a good horizontal model today, which uh, we just had a meeting at, at OHA, is um, is Hawaii Investment Ready here. It's it's um, Hawaiian Hawaii, Investment Ready. It's it's a it's called it's an accelerator program for okay. for businesses mm -hmm. and and nonprofits. To, to get them to be self-sustaining and to to be able to stand on their own, and it's it's funded by um, uh, the um, Felicitas, Felicitas Foundation, and um, it's directed by um, Uncle Neil Hannas and from KS and and stuff. And and what they do is they are creating a horizontal platform for vertical businesses mm -hmm. to first learn how they can maximize their value, mm -hmm. but then create an ecosystem where they are side by side with each other where where they they can create vertical value but they can also create horizontal value within this ecosystem that they're creating and and right now they're they're working on that infrastructure so by having a number of businesses that's that connect with each other in some way you expand the whole base of everything right. that allows more growth Right, and then and as a that's a that's an organizational level network, mm -hmm. right? You, mm -hmm. We we can even see people uh, compensating horizontal activity now um, in developing countries. One one good example is now uh, banks or or lending institutions mm. are actually using mobile phone data mm -hmm. to track people's movements. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, okay, although this person doesn't have a credit history or their credit history is poor due to um, volatile economics in that, in that area, um, we can see that this person talks to these same 10 people or has this network that they, that they are a part of. And therefore, since they have that form of stability, we can give them a loan. And, and, so, and they can use that as a base, perhaps, to start their own business. And that's a, a tangible way of compensating horizontal mm -hmm. activity, mm -hmm. as a human being horizontal mm -hmm. activity. 
So right now, we're just starting to, to explore this, this space, this horizontal space. And, and once we, we can come up with, in, with an infrastructure that can take into account these horizontal spaces, then we can have a more inclusive economic system. Mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of where, where, where I'm coming from when, when yeah. talking about economic development at the it, grassroots it, level. It's still a little Hawaii, esoteric in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, right, but there are tangible examples now, so we're starting to see, and and whether the people that are making these these steps are viewing it this way or not, they're just seeing it as a need or mm -hmm. as a new space to operate. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, it's fine. We just we just need greater density in in where we can um, recognize and exchange value as a society. Where the different vertical industries mm -hmm. somehow connect horizontally and people and the people, yeah. how they connect up and how that's going to broaden the base yeah. for everybody to participate more in the wealth. Right, right. Fantastic. Yeah. So what is OHA doing exactly in your capacity? Uh, uh, they, they're looking for projects to... Uh, yeah, we, we seek out um, partners, partnerships to... Mm -hmm. to uh, we, we have a certain amount of resources at OHA that we that we can use to further these things. Of course, uh, you know, as an organization, a vertically aligned organization, we, we also need partners to get stuff done. And um, we're looking for, for partners in a variety of different, uh, different arenas, whether it's land management, stewardship, yeah. or um, economic development for Native Hawaiians, uh, economic self-sufficiency, these kinds of things. So uh, there's a few things in, in, in works right now. Uh, we're, we're open to people approaching us and, and saying if they have any ideas, you know, it's... Wonderful. Well, we hope whoever is listening today will come to you with some ideas. Yeah. And Ron, our time is up. And I just want to thank you so much for uh, coming up with not only smart thinking, some really thoughtful... And to see your progression. You know, this is the classic James K Joseph Campbell hero's journey that you've gone from, from your home place and out into the world yeah. and learned a heck of a lot from some really uh, unusual sources and, broad, and then brought it back for the benefit of the community. Yeah, that, that reminds me of a quote, the T.S. Eliot quote, right? Um, it it's, goes something like, um, and at the end of all our exploring um, is to return to the same place and know the place for the first time. And know the place for the first time because so you're looking at it with a whole new perspective. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of that kind of embodies my my experience. So. It's yeah. wonderful to have you back and to have you with us, and I wish you a lot of luck. And thanks for being on today. Thanks. And that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for viewing with us. Aloha. Great. That's great. Huh? Always so fun. Well, I think that's great. I mean, it's a great story, and uh, you know, you can't do it. You've got to do it. Well, why did he have to be having to do it? He said he was being senior. Oh, no, I, oh, yeah, he came last time. He came last time. Oh, he didn't work. He didn't work. Yeah. <laughs>